arrived at Farley Mount at about 22, 25 We sat in the car for about 15 minutes, just chatting and kissing. Furthest from the entrance. Graham and I got into the back of the car and started to have sex on the back Kissing seat. and cuddling for about five or ten on minutes. on the seat and Graham was on top of After me. about five minutes, the front driver's door opened. And a man shone the torch at us. He was wearing a black coloured woolen type balaclava on his head. The man was holding a gun at us. a handgun in his right hand, which was pointed at my head. Get on your knees and face the back of the car. Hands behind your backs. The man then tied up Graham's hands using black plastic tape. I then heard the sound of sticky tape being pulled off a roll. He wound this round my head, leaving only a small gap for my nostrils. It's okay. Keep calm and no one will get hurt. I think he then said, I'm going to put you in the boot. I then felt the car move as though something had been put in the boot. He then closed the boot lid. The man picked me up quite easily and put me over his shoulder. And then heard one set of footsteps walk toward the I back of the car. I got the impression we were going down a footpath. I did not hear I thought that he was going to put me down on some grass, but he put me down in the back of a pickup type truck. He then got into the cab and started to drive. I then heard the gears crunch loudly twice before it drove off. I eventually managed to free myself from the boot. Walked around shouting out Sally's name looking for her. girl has been abducted at gunpoint from a beauty spot near Winchester and sexually assaulted. Police are linking the incident with three previous attacks in the same area. They were approached by a man holding what's thought to have been a pistol. He then dragged the girl into his car before subjecting her to a 30-minute drive around the area. He then stopped the vehicle and sexually attacked her. On each occasion he uh, produces a shiny black pistol. Uh, there are long wide cable ties which are used to tie up the couples. Um, he uses a canvas type shoulder bag which is light cream or light blue. Well spoken in his late teens to early forties, always wears a ski mask and army tops. One of the most worrying aspects of uh, this series of attacks uh, for me is the, the very calm, calculating way that this person behaves. Farley Mount, a thousand acres of countryside in Woodland just outside Winchester and the site of one of the longest running series of unsolved serious crimes in Britain. Since January 1991, four couples have been attacked by a man in a balaclava, armed with a gun, demanding money. Once they fought him off, but three times he's gone on to tie up the man and sexually assault the woman. In the worst case, driving his victim to a remote house and raping her. Now, with another couple menaced at gunpoint, the police have decided to call in the offender profilers. I am Julian Boone. I'm a chartered forensic psychologist and I've been referred a case by the National Crime Faculty and the officers are coming today to give us a presentation and my role will be to see if there's anything from a psychological angle that I can contribute. There's a host of things I'll be looking at. There is no detail, for example, too small in any case which wouldn't be um, of importance to me. The, the first thing is to lay everything on the table and from those salient case details slowly hone it down by personality analysis to see what kind of individual you're looking for. But the police are, will have specific, specific questions and in the sort of case we're talking about today I would imagine it would be will he do it again, has he done it before, right up front will be what they'll want to know and until we've seen all the details it won't be possible to give an answer. Unusually, and at the police's request, Julian Boone was working on the case with Dr. Richard Babcock, now a consultant psychiatrist at Brampton Special Hospital. Usually they work apart. The only other case they're covering together, that of the Manchester GP, Harold Shipman. I mean, there are 11, 12 car parks at uh, Farley Mount, you can see on your map. Today, the senior officer on the inquiry can't be present. In his place is his number two. Detective Sergeant John Gunner. Gunner's largely responsible for keeping the inquiry alive. This is where we know in 92 he parked his car. 1991. I saw a man standing looking into the car. He was holding a gun, pointing it into the car. The man said, lay the seats back and turn on your fronts. I looked and saw that he was tying Paul's hands and ankles with a rope. He tied the rope also around the steering wheel. Whilst he was doing this, the man said, are you nervous? Paul said, yes, I'm nervous. And the man said, not as nervous as me. He then asked me if there was anything else he could use to tie Karen up. I told him there may be some 
Moore rope in the boot. He went and had a look but found nothing, so he went to Karen's side of the car and threatened to use her tights. She then got very upset and instead he produced a knife and cut the passenger's side seat belt and tied Karen fairly loosely with the belt. I then heard the man rustling behind the passenger door. He said, lift your head up. He then put a bag over my head. He said, turn over. I screamed, no, no. Paul shouted, leave her alone. I then felt the man put his hand down my knuckles and pull the front of them down. I think Karen said, he's doing it, Paul. And then Karen, I think, said to the man that she had her period. The man said, I'm not gonna fuck you if you're on. Then I heard the man throw the keys a little way from the car. The kinds of things that he's built into his handling of the victims has to mean, I think, that he's based that on actual experience. He has, he has a good understanding of what the victims are going through. No, knows, you know, what to say to reassure them. So he's had uh, victims before. Um, Worrying the accomplished, I'm afraid. Because there's one point at which he, he seems to be almost chatting to them as if they're all part of a, a ripping wheeze or a, an adventure. Are you scared? Are you scared? It's where they're talking to each other about scared. Scared. Oh, no, I'm It's always sort of yes. chummy. It, that's right. It's sort of false chumminess, which is sort of drawing them into his private fantasy. Mm. Isn't it? So they're playing the part. There's a new fight club. It's as old as London town. But for the slaves and prostitutes who bought their freedom from the Romans, there was only one way out. Combat, Sunday at 8, on Discovery. How did a horrific real-life kidnapping inspire the most famous murder mystery novel of all time? Uncover the facts behind the fiction. Every fortnight, an elegant hardback edition of a classic novel comes with a magazine about the author's life, times and inspirations. The Agatha Christie Collection. Part one is at Newsagents Now. I'm having a lovely time here without you. This is the first postcard I've ever written. Things are different now. Oh, are they? I never realized how easy it is to live without you. Thousands of people are getting rid of their writing gremlins. Call 08000 150 650 and get on. Maybe it's because our energy efficiency advisors are helping customers lower the cost of their bills. Whatever it is, now over two million people have come back home to British Gas. One day, you'll be able to send and receive music on your mobile. Nokia, connecting people. Why can't you just be straight with me for a change? I mean, what are you, a man or a... New Muller Light Moose, it moves beloved. If you've tried to give up smoking before, you know how difficult it is. That's why this totally new Nicotin CQ lozenge has been developed. It's a combination of power and speed to help tackle your worst cravings fast. You see, it puts you in control. Because you plan the number you use according to your particular cravings. And you use less and less till you're free. The totally new CQ lozenge puts you in control to help you quit successfully. Starting in tomorrow's mirror, play the exciting new Make Money game. Match up two hard for special banknotes to win from a tenner to a massive one million pounds. Get your game card only in tomorrow's mirror. In 1996, there was an abduction. When he was at Susie's door, I tried to have a look at him. He said, face round. I didn't want to argue. He sounded very calm. He said, I'm taking your girlfriend with me. 
she can come back and untie you. You turn left out of car park toward Winchester. After about 30 seconds after the turn, and I said, can't you drop me here? He did not reply. About a mile and a half later, he pulled into a lay-by on the left. He took hold of my right arm and began pulling me out of the car. I could just see that he had put his hand down towards the belt on his dark trousers and he said, you know you want it. I said no and pushed him away. I said, you can just let me go with this thing on my head and you can just drive off. So her being Volshi, it's yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. The most revealing thing is his ability to call it quits. No, this is, it looked good, it should have been right, but this is not one that we're going to pursue. And there aren't many sex offenders, I think, who are capable of showing this kind of prudence and control. 1992, she was taken to a house where she was taken upstairs at that house and laid on a bed. As he was carrying me, he said, it's a good job I used to be a fireman. He then said, I'm going to get you some pretty clothes to wear. When he came back into the room, he put more tape over my eyes. It felt like three strips. I then felt him cut the tyres off my hands and feet. He then put a dress on me, which was woolen, loose, um, with a large neck, like a polar neck and long sleeves. He opened my legs and got on top of me. I'm sorry for doing that. My wife died and I've been a widow for six years and I haven't had sex. He then put me in the back of the pickup and got in the front and drove off. But it, it looks as if what we're seeing is the emergence of a, a psychopathic character, it is a personality. Here's a man who knows how to exploit people. Uh, he knows the social tricks of the trade, as it were. He, he knows how to use his, um, his powers of speech you know, in a way that um, a, a salesman, like, you, know, the, you know, the archetypal sort of glib, um, shady salesman. Well, 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 this is this guy. It just occurred to me, a state agent? Yeah, we've, we've considered that. Yeah. Oh. Occupations that, that, that require these, these particular skills, because he, he'll be good at what he does, you see, where, where the ability to tell a plausible lie is, is a valued commodity. Oh, He's a politician, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Well, these are bijou, these are bijou crimes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So he, he's, he's a member of the cabinet. <laughs> The major obstacle the police face in this inquiry is that in seven years the rapist has left no forensic trace behind. No scrap of DNA, no fibre from his clothing, no sight of his face. His planning is meticulous. This investigation has been going on now for, for over seven years. I'm very concerned about uh, these offences. I'm very concerned about a recurrence of these offences. I want to do all that I can to make sure that we catch this person in the uh, shortest possible time. So that's really why I'm uh, using all, all avenues that are open to me. And one of those is, uh, is speaking to people like uh, Julian Boone and Richard Badcock and other people in the area to see what they can do to assist me. Today, the profilers are to see the crime scenes. But at Farley Mount, without consulting them, Steve Watts has also invited the media, one television crew from the local BBC station, one from ITV's Britain's Most Wanted. Normally, even the use of a profiler is kept a closely guarded secret. What I've tried to do today is to, is to focus all the media attention in, in one hit because, you know, my time's uh, very, very limited. Uh, the time of uh, Richard and Julian is very limited. So what I've tried to do is get everyone to come along here today and uh, say, let's do it all in one hit. So uh, we're going to get the media coverage, the publicity, which we need, um, the oxygen and the inquiry, really. So uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish today. Yeah, I would earnestly suggest that, that any local publicity is avoided. Um, Until after November. November. There's a preponderance around this time in November, and if it's for whatever reason meaningful or useful because of night cover um, and a limited amount of foliage still on the trees, um, we wouldn't want to miss the opportunity should an anniversary be important to him. Well, m one of my concerns there would be the, the issue of prevention, of course, because yes. that's as important as yes, the detection of course, of crime. That's I wouldn't true, in, you know, in a position of being attacked by him because we're holding off on publicity. Indeed. Leading up to that. Eventually, it is agreed that the BBC local news should leave. No. 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 <laughs> well, it was, it was a Because spine. I know that they'll have a two minute hole in the programme this okay. evening. <laughs> um, oh, let me give him a ring. Sorry about that, but that's. Um, 
Well, that's just something that's come up this morning whilst we've been talking. So we don't particularly want to go out tonight. But ITV's Britain's Most Wanted can stay, on condition their programme does not go out until the new year at the earliest. At last, profilers and police set off to see the rapist's terrain. I'm the beat man here. I've been on the beat since 89. You've got about 12 car parks here. On this time of day, there is a lock of dog walkers. Favourite place for families and children. It is a lunchtime liaison point for corking couples. Normally you'll find two cars together and both in one car. And then as we go into the night, it's the younger corking couples that come up here. It's used quite a bit by peepers as well. And I will show you a, a set of favourite peeping area in a moment. We've identified about 10 or 15 people in frequent this area, yes. and climb into the tree and, and do yes. their peeping. I mean, you can see where the branches here are smoothed out by overuse by people sitting. Mm. You yes, you can actually. Yeah, so sorry. it's alright, this is as far as I go. But... Now, I mean, I wonder whether or not, you know, the, the people who would come and do this sort of thing are the sort of person who'd be, who'd have the, the ability to plan and everything else in terms of committing the full offence. Well, the psychology of standing up here is very different to the psychology of, uh, of wanting to sort of be in complete control of everything on the ground. So. Oh, yeah. I've looked at these people more as witnesses yes. than as yeah. potential offenders. Yeah, I, I would imagine that was actually entirely right. <laughs> And, we, and this is where she was, was it frog marched or carried over? Yeah. And I, I think also there's another element there. And she said, oh, good job I used to be a fireman. That's sort of not just control, but yes. um, confidence and, um, I don't know, fitness in some way. Braggadocio. Mm -hmm. okay. So my concern is, is if you got in a situation where somebody resisted, uh, in a more physical way and started compromising forensically, is he possibly going to go over the mark and, and try and, if you like, eliminate that, that problem by perhaps killing the girl or disposing of the I think the, the, the only more likely scenario is that he would withdraw once the heat went up. If he goes the extra mile, it will be, I think, as a result of, a, of an intelligent decision rather than a react an emotional reaction. Unless, uh, it's, unless it's, as part of his plan, he's already thought through that scenario. What if? What if, oh, you know, so. yeah, what if I, I get blood on me from her? What if I get my blood on her? Somehow that, that isn't how he approaches things. God, it's getting cold, isn't it? The profilers also insist on seeing the scene at night, the time of all the attacks. You don't want to go up that tree at night, do you, Richard, by any chance? <laughs> you may find you've got friends if you go up there now. <laughs> We both think that, that what we've got is somebody who's not just showing self-control, it's somebody who uh, applies himself to a, to a code of discipline. And, and if, you, if you ally that to um, things like the, the pistol, uh, the camouflage jacket, yes. then really you have to think seriously about the army, uh, and I'm afraid the mm. police. Yeah. Uh, then they present the police with a surprising deduction from their daytime observations. Julian picked up uh, an extremely uh, astute point um, uh, in the car, which is that um, none of the offences have taken place when Chris is on duty. <laughs> so we look at Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well, no, 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 no he, we don't think so. <laughs> this is very much um, his yeah. patch. It's certainly something that shouldn't be ignored. Well, what about a level of intelligence? I mean, oh, high. Yeah, high, high, high. You know, you're looking at officer status. Uh, probably not high rank, but, but definitely officer material. The Hampshire police break their agreement with the offender profilers. In December, Britain's Most Wanted leads with the story of the Farley Mount attacks, contrary to the profilers' advice that the programme should hold off until the new year, at the very earliest. Frustrated detectives have now turned to criminal psychologists to draw up a profile of the man they're hunting. They believe understanding the way he acts and thinks could be the only way to track him down. They start by examining his crime scenes. Yeah, I was quite shocked actually to hear that there was a bit about the uh, 
the case on, on that. Um, I haven't spoken to the police about it, but, um, but I do hope they haven't made a mistake in, in releasing that kind of public information about the guy, which yes. is advantageous to him, but not to, you know, not, not to us. I suppose we have to accept at the end of the day that it's, <coughs> it's not our turf. Really. That's right. Um, and, That's right. Uh, uh, I'm glad we at least advised that the information shouldn't go out. It's very important for the senior investigating officer to remember that he is in control of the investigation. This investigation is my investigation. I have the sole responsibility for making sure that it's progressed effectively and efficiently. I'm in control. I will listen to what psychologists have got to tell me. I will deal with it in the appropriate way, but I will make the decisions. Well, we're here today, aren't we, to meet again with Hampshire Police. And in addition, we're going to be meeting with people from the Behavioural Science Unit at Surrey, um, who've been approaching this under the offender profiling banner, but as you're well aware, I am well aware, there are very different types of things. We're very much more of the psychological side. This is more of a statistical oh, approach and so on. It's going to be a genuine battle then. <laughs> <laughs> certainly not, certainly not. It'll be um, a, a synergy, synergistic exercise, or whatever these Americans call it. We'll offer to show them ours after he's shown us his. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Just like schoolboys do. <laughs> OK. Watts has united the warring disciplines of forensic and statistical analysis in the hope that they can agree on a common conclusion. But there's a long history of disagreement between the two schools. I think probably I'll say some general observations. Disappointingly from your point of view, John Steve, is that he will have a, a normal seeming regular appearance. He's not going to be someone who stands out as a misfit or a loner. This is a private world that he operates in when he goes around on this um, on these quarrying escapades with a view he has it himself as someone who prances through the woods at nights and stalks quarry with his uh, rape kit satchel and has a gun like this and goes around the pouncing and can successfully commit these crimes and not be caught and so on. He has absolutely no um, effective conscience if you wish and psychopathy is very much part of this man's makeup, part of the way he deals with the world and the people. Whilst I've been, you know, extraordinarily interested in what's been said, there were, you know, quite a number of things I thought, well, that would be very nice to know, but, you know, how, how do we get to that stage? So I would like to open it up in terms of some of the more easily researchable issues, which is very much my angle, um, possibly because it's, it's database-led. What the database does enable us to do is to break the offence down. Does the offender wear a disguise? Does he blindfold the victim? Does he bind the victim? And that sort of dual level data collection procedure is very much the heart of the bad man database as it exists. I do believe he'd be known to the police. I don't think he, he is likely to have had a, a totally normal upbringing and then suddenly age late 20s gone, I'm going to get into crime and do it perfectly. I think he's been sort of schooled in that and may well have bounced off various police officers, not necessarily in Hampshire. Could I just ask, does of course that come you could. from um, the uh, data set, or is that your clinical judgment <coughs> no, on I mean the basis I, of experience? I would like to, yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd opt out of any, any, any words preceded by clinical, in that I don't claim to be a clinical psychologist. Um, well, clinical in, with a small c means appraising a case um, on its individual merits, Right, I see, yeah. Whereas the opposite end of the scale is the database. Yeah. And I just wanted <coughs> to be clear about that. But when you said, I don't feel... Sorry, yeah. I mean, I'm I not disagreeing with you, incidentally, but I just, no. I just wanted to know where that was coming from. Is that something that leaps out of the database? No, thanks for, for picking that up. I mean, I will talk of I feel, I think. This is obviously a sort of an amalgamation of the database. My experience, having chatted with right. uh, Rupert Heritage, the head of the unit, his experience both, you know... So experience plays a big part. Oh, it does. I think it has to. This is quite rare behaviour. So you have to step back and look at the behavioural style rather than the... So with a small c, it is a clinical judgement principally, and a database one secondary. Well, it depends on your view, because I it's... Think it's I think what, what I would like to hear, really, is, is the full content of, of Adam's finding. Then, then oh, perhaps we, we can get into the, the debate about, you know... I, I've heard what I wanted to hear use of that particular type of binding again is very very rare again they're the only four cases on the database we have at present it's not an obvious choice unless you've either been used to restraining people in that way in which case we're back into police training or 
army training. I was a bit, I was a bit worried when I, I heard that um, you know a possible link with the army being mentioned on on television just before Christmas. Actually, what I think of it, I was going to ask, did the information having come out, did you get any response from the, the media coverage? Did you? Uh, tremendous response, we had over 250 calls. Right, well, was there anything about the army in it? It was very apparent that the tactics portrayed by the offender at Farley Mount uh, duplicated very closely snatch type tactics that are taught by armed services and the method of restraint is always the plastic ties. I have to, I have to say that, that I haven't heard a lot today that, that, that suggests to me a particular strategy I can now follow from today that I haven't before. Right. Just like I, mean, I would have no problem with um, acquisitive offences being in this man's nature. Um, theft, cutting corners, not paying tax, the sort of thing I would have thought would have been uh, second nature to him. There's also this ability to lull victims into a false sense of security as it were. So, um, so something involving fraud? I mean, this, mm. is the, this is the danger. If we get down to the level of just throwing impossibles, then you, you know, may as well say, get on the crime system and give me all the criminals. No, I mean, right, yeah. that's, yeah, I mean, I'm, but, but the, I feel right. like I'm harping on, but, but it would be really agree, useful but, if we but, can but find you. You have, to, you have to draw from, must include the acquisitive offences. Yeah. Well, well, if I go back to the, to the sort of start of this bit of the discussion, because I'm, uh, I'm enough of a psychiatrist to recognise that when somebody says, I've listened to you going on all day and you haven't told me a single thing that helps me <laughs> generate a line of inquiry, he's not just complaining about us. This is the sort of frustration of, <laughs> of some time. Out. No surprises really. I didn't expect to come along here to, today and to be given some nugget that I was going to take away and was going to lead me to identifying the offender. I didn't expect that at all. I think really the, the major benefit to me as a senior investigating officer is that uh, I am now relatively confident, or very confident, that I've done all that I possibly can in terms of following all possible lines of inquiry to identify this offender. <laughs> Train one group of people using high-tech sports science. Train another using traditional military methods. And after six weeks of grueling training, who do you think turns out fittest? Find out in Fighting Fit starting January 21st on Discovery. Ready, dear? I challenge you to match the excellent value of the Saxo Quartet at only $5,995. Or the Zara LX for just $8,995. Or even the Zara Picasso SX for just $11,995. Go on, take up the Citroen Challenge today. Citroen Challenge. Want to see it again? The Titanic. Recreate the magic of the most celebrated liner of all time by constructing this amazing wooden model. Build the Titanic is a new collection with all the model sections and step-by-step -step instructions to assemble week by week this stunning model. Part one with model sections, construction plan and two magazines, only $1.99. Usual price $3.99. Experience Oasis on the edge of the Lake District and enjoy over 100 activities. Oasis, nowhere comes close. For a brochure, call 08705 086 086. What I was doing a year ago, 12 months ago, to now, is immeasurable the change for me, devastating. Stroke at 37, that's unbelievable, you know? Part of the blood clot tore off and went through, straight through my head. I can't work now. My balance goes, dribbles coming out. And then it starts it start slurring your words. You don't want to tell people you're disabled. I can't carry a bag of shopping now. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about what feelings you had inside oh. you when you used to see those anti-smoking ads. <sighs> Mental decline is not an inevitable part of aging. The average 70-year-old has 97% of the brain cells they had at 25. Even in our 80s, we can develop new brain cells. So you can see, we can afford to lose a few. <laughs>
but no need to worry. Our minds stay agile for longer if we keep active, stimulated and, and challenged. Challenged. Checkmate. Active care is something we're passionate about at Bupa. Bupa, the personal health service. Care homes, health insurance. Health assessment. Hospitals. This Sunday in the Sunday Times. Make a date with all the top sporting events of the year with the free Sunday Times giant glossy sports wall calendar. think that uh, he's going to be a very difficult one to catch because he's tremendously forensically aware um, and he's very very slick in his operation and he's very careful in terms of selecting sites. He has the capacity to um, up sticks and leave if the conditions aren't right, even midway through the commission of a crime. He's monitoring it all at a cognitive level, right through the thing. There's no loss of control. So if you add all that lot in together, he's a very clever, well-rounded offender, and annoyingly would love to hear me describe him such. Then suddenly there's a breakthrough. As the police plough through hundreds of calls to Britain's most wanted, they unearth what they see as the first decent suspect in seven years of painstaking investigation. So how did he come in? I can't remember. Somebody found him. Somebody found up about him, said that they'd um, met him while they were on a course. And oh, she didn't yeah. like the way that he spoke to her. Yeah. So he didn't sound particularly interesting when we first had the message no. about him. But it appears he joined the Navy in 1963, and um, when he left... Well, something, now, you mentioned before he was a weapons officer? Yeah, he was a leading weapons artificer apprentice. The subject we've got now um, has got a bit of a military background, having been in the Navy. Then it's interesting that he joins the police force and um, he's in there some considerable time. Whilst he's in the police force, he obviously acquires some forensic knowledge. And according to his file, which is quite scant, um, he received um, good results in his courses and his training. Yeah. He was sacked, and this is where it gets a bit more interesting. Yeah. He was convicted um, for a conspiracy to defraud. That was the first indictment, and the second one was um, demand with menaces, and he got 12 months consecutively for each one. Right. So I'd imagine that's. He gets it. convicted for a um, conspiracy to defraud which f fits in nicely with the profile. Uh, and we've got to mention somewhere that um, he may have an indecency uh, offence connected to him. Which was that he exposed himself and masturbated in front of a woman. So it wasn't his turn then? <laughs> no. Um, and then he joins an insurance company and becomes a manager, which fits nicely with the profile. Then he's got uh, a job in Southampton and an address in East. He's very close to finding him out. So we'll put all those together, it looks nice, but at the moment it's just very circumstantial really. I, I will have to back that up with some evidence. The first step, a low-key surveillance operation. Do I look cool? Anyway, we've already come about 63 miles from Farley Mount. It's quite a long way. Probably got about another five to go. What we're going to do today, we're going to... The subject we've got who lives in Sussex, our intention is to drive from Farley Mount to the address in Sussex, the most direct route, to get an idea of the distance, and that'll give us a rough idea of how long it may take to travel. And then once we get there, we want to have a look at the house, get a feel for the area of the house and see the vehicles on the drive. And to be honest, anything else that jumps out and hits us by looking at the house and the area. Third on our left. I think 
you get Earl Grey tea there. She did say. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a big house, so it's going to take a lot of people. Yeah. Quite a lot of time to, to get through it all. That's an all-day job then, really, isn't it? Yeah. To search that house. Thoroughly. With a suspect who fits the verbal profile given to them, Hampshire now desperately need the final written report from the profilers. But Dr. Badcock is months late with it. My experience is that the, when I fail to meet deadlines, there's usually some other issue as well going along in the background. And uh, I think in this case, it's a sense of unease about the thing that the report may be used for. Um, the, you know, I'm happy that um, that uh, I've given the the analysis my best shot. You know, the chap is uh, a genuine psychopath, which isn't that common. He is a voyeur. Um, he has got a, a code of which he's consciously adopted, um, which sort of sits against the psychopathy and suggests that he's adopted it from an organisation that he's belonged to at some stage. So the actual profile is fairly straightforward, but um, I'm just a bit worried that the investigation may be uh, trying to use that to, to identify the offender, um, and that isn't the purpose of profiling. At the heart of his unease about the Farley Mount inquiry is the Rachel Nickell case, the classic instance of how not to use an offender profile. It was here that Rachel was found yesterday, stabbed repeatedly, sexually assaulted, her two-year-old son Alexander clinging to her body. In the ensuing frenzy, the police arrested Colin Stagg. The only reason he was a suspect was his close fit with the offender profile. The only evidence against him, rambling conversations drawn out of him by an attractive female undercover officer, briefed by the offender profiler. After two days of the trial, all charges against Stagg were dropped. The judge dismissed the case as an appalling example of entrapment. He reserved his harsh criticisms for the role played by Dr. Paul Britton, the offender profiler. If you go back to the case of Rachel Nickell, you know, there, there was one particular suspect at the time. Um, but afterwards, it was clear that there were actually huge numbers of people <laughs> on Wimbledon Common that day who, um, you know, who weren't so totally different um, to, to the profile. The profile is, is professional guesswork. It's not more than that. It's not different to that. It's not uh, an evidential basis for, um, you know, for, for fingering an individual. <laughs> Dr. Badcock doesn't share his worries with Hampshire, and nor does he write his final report. Unaware of his reservations, but keenly aware his senior officer wants to close the inquiry, John Gunner is keen to demonstrate the similarity between the new suspect and the profiler's verbal report. We've still got one or two things outstanding, but I think that we've come to the stage where all viable inquiries that justify a full team working on this investigation um, have come to an end. So uh, I'd just like really to thank you all for the hard work you put in over a long period of time. OK, um, just going back to Boone and Bangkok and uh, Adam Gregor. I know we've got a report from Adam. Have we got anything from them? There we are. Which yeah. they promised faithfully, didn't they? They did. I'm, I'm, I'm chasing them up. Can you chase them a bit faster? Yeah. Good. I might overtake them. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's talk about Mr F*** then. We had a, um, a phone call. Um, from a lady and the only reason she phoned us she said that he um, came across as if he thought he was God's gift to women but gave her the creeps basically and um, he would do things like pull out of his um, coat pocket a shotgun cartridges and go oh look what I've left in my pocket and did the same thing with a hunting knife or That's something right, yeah, yeah. she really didn't like the way he came across and and that was it purely to start with perhaps it's easier if we start off telling you actually about his history yeah, yeah. Um, and if you, the best thing to do when we tell you about this history is just basing it on the profile that yeah. Mrs. Boone and Badcock have given us, and, and you'll notice why we're particularly interested in him. Okay. Well, you're not basing his, his history on the profile, you compare Not at all, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did I say that? You said basing Did it. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> Freudian slip, I think. Yeah. Okay. okay, he was um, born in um, 47. 
on his application form to explain the gap when he went to prison, he's put that he was a security consultant. And the reason that he left that post was the um, termination of his contract. Mm. So he's got a bit of a sense of humour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's obviously quite cocky with it to put something that close to it, rather than just put self-employed whatever. Okay. What's he doing now? He's now um, working as a financial consultant, and he's uh, working from home. Interesting, the deception side of things. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, as you go through that description, you're ticking yeah. off bits of the profile. Mm. Yeah, lots of it. And his hobbies, play business, you mean? BAS, what's that? British Association. British Association of Shooting and Conservation. So his hobbies all profile fits. I mean, I mean obviously, I mean, he's, he's got to be worth it. The thing about someone as interesting, I mean, obviously, he's only interesting because he fits the profile. Mm. That's the only reason at the moment. Well, it's not just fitting the profile, it's, it's the, the locational issues as well. Yeah. Lots of coincidences. Yeah. It's, it's not just yeah. Yeah. that he fits, you know, what Julian and, and Richard Bacot yeah. yeah. are telling us. There are other issues that yeah. make them interesting. Well, the person we were discussing does, um, does fit quite neatly into the profile, and what we've got to guard against is that we don't start going down that road and assuming that just because a person um, fits the profile given to us by the offender profiles, that they must, if so facto, be the offender. Um, there are one or two other issues that make me interested in the individual, um, particularly uh, the locations where he's lived and worked um, over the past few years, uh, at times close to the offences. So it's for those reasons as well that we're going to look very, very closely at the, at the person. But there's no question that uh, you know, he's going to be arrested and interviewed just on the basis of the profile. We're going to have to have a lot more information before we take that sort of action. Nevertheless, privately, Steve Watts instructs his team to research the suspect fully and prepare for an arrest. The Hampshire police have now been waiting for a year for Dr. Richard Badcock's profile of the Farley Mount attacker. While they wait, routine takes over. November is one of the key months in the attacker's calendar. They decide to mount a substantial undercover operation, the first for three years. Uh, you've got your up orders. Uh, they've changed slightly from the original um, setup. Not a lot. You got, have you got a problem with sit sitting in the uh, in the vehicle, Louise? I'm having a little think about it at the moment. Just that okay. it's something obviously we've discussed before, and it was yeah. definitely definitely not going to be right. done. Mm. And it's been a bit sprung upon me, to be honest. Okay. You yeah. know, before she can appreciate, I am the only likely person here to be abducted. <laughs> and Adrian makes a lovely <laughs> woman, but. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I didn't show tonight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want, you can put the body armor on immediately. I mean, no. Because we've got two sets. Take that stuff. No. no. The stage is set. John and Louise are in the unmarked car parked in the car park. Chris Musselwhite is lookout. And there are other officers stationed a discreet distance away. No attack you've ever taken place when I've been on duty, unfortunately. Um, it's a bit worrying, really. Um, does somebody know my duty pattern? I spend a lot of time up here. Suddenly a car approaches the target area. Yeah, Roger, I see him coming up from Winchester. Vehicle approaching from Winchester, Chris. I should get a bit closer. Chris, can you give us an update, please? Yeah, vehicle will be believed now is static in Junction Car Park. Uh, the lights are all off, so I can't actually see him from where I am. Louise and I will be in a position to put our reflectives on and approach the car. Move them on if you wish. Very caught in camera, we'll move them on. Beautiful. Then the man gets out of the car. No, didn't get that. He's coming on foot. <gasps> yeah, Roger. Shit. And then they lose sight of him. To everyone's relief, he gets back in his car and drives away without Hampshire intercepting the vehicle. Shit. I can't believe it. you saw him coming towards us and lost sight of him. I don't know whether he went back or not. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> don't do that to us. Nothing further comes of the November surveillance, 
No sightings or alarms. The inquiry comes to a standstill. Steve Watts goes to Kosovo to take temporary charge of the British forensic team out there. Back in Southampton, John Gunner is still waiting for Dr. Badcock's report. I've um, been looking at this man since probably May, probably a year. And before, like I said, before I can really approach him, I need that in writing to base my rationale. Because at the moment, I'm just going on conversations like that with him and my own rough notes. And um, if I highlight everything, say that they're saying he's in contacts in the insurance world, he would have uh, sort of indecency um, offences against him, that sort of thing. And I can say, look, our man, this, 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 and this. But at that moment, I've got nothing to compare it with. So it's, it's, um, it is annoying because I would have liked to have spoken to him, eliminated him or implicated him before now. After 18 months, Dr. Badcock has finally delivered his 10-page report. John Gunner is surveying the area with a local beat officer. Whatever Dr. Badcock's reservations, Hampshire sees his profile as the green light for an arrest of their prime suspect. But Dr. Badcock's written report now, I can use as a rationale to arrest uh, that subject. Um, it's, a, it's a bit brief, I'll have to say, uh, when you compare it with the, um, the several conferences we've had with both doctors. Um, I would, have, I would have liked a bit more detail, I think, but more or less it, 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 you know, it, it encompasses exactly what we're looking for. Really, I'm, I'm pinning my hopes on either the man admitting and or finding something in his possession, either at his home or a place he's got control over, that might connect him to any of the offences. I still want to speak to Dr Boone to discuss an interview strategy in relation to him. But once again, the profilers are reluctant to do Hampshire's bidding. The only thing we can do is, is to divorce this from Parliament altogether. We can, but we'd be forever open to the accusation mm -hmm. that uh, we might not have been successful in so doing. Mm -hmm. Well, hello, John. It's Julian calling. I've got an old friend of yours with me. His name is Richard Badcock. So what I'll do is I'll pass him over to you now. <laughs> <laughs> Complete bastard. Uh, hi, John. Hi, it's Richard. Hi. Um, John, the, um, the, I'm genius right, we have come to some conclusions, but they're, they're, they're not quite in line with what you were asking. Um, I think John is um, desperate to get some sort of handle on the case, and, uh, you know, all credit to him for persisting with it. But the, uh, this is definitely a piece of advice that should not be given. Um, not by us. Ready, dear? I challenge you to match the excellent value of the Saxo Quartet at only 5995. Or the Zara LX for just 8995. Or even the Zara Picasso SX for just 11995. Go on, take up the Citroen Challenge today. Citroen Challenge. Want to see it again? I still can't get over this sundial thing, you know. A whole month of free national and local calls from the sun. I know. And we could save 25% on our phone bills for the whole year. Free calls for a month, starting only in tomorrow's sun. I don't know what we do without it. I really don't. <laughs> I know. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, here goes. No, I suppose it'll do. Hang about. Hmm. Smells like golden syrup. Oh, oh, she'll love it. Shame about the perfume. Nice bag, though. Oats so simple. Now in four irresistible flavours. On Discovery Next, we take the plunge Hollywood style when the beautiful people of Tinseltown decide to make a lifelong commitment to love. The Hampshire officers are still interested in the prime suspect, but now, alarmed by the profiler's reservations, they decide on a low-key approach. Well, this morning we're going to try and um, interview this chap at his home address. And at this stage, we really don't think we've got enough to arrest him, really. So I'm, I'm happy at the moment, yeah, just to go and interview him. So what do you want me to do, then? I'll just chat him up and be lovely. Chat him up? Yeah. I want us to just go in there and be relaxed and sort yeah. of... Yeah. I want I him to... be relaxed. Yeah, you can be relaxed. Yeah, have, a, have a nap. <laughs> make a tea. I'd offer to make tea. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna be quite happy to let him know how his name got mentioned. Obviously, no details of who, but how. Yeah, that's right. I want to be upfront with him and say that but lots of publicity on the telly and loads of people, as it, as they were, were nominated, and he was one of them. And we've just got and we've eventually come out to him. And the ideal scenario after all this, all this pressure. We bubbling up inside him at the end of it. My last yeah. question on the pro forma is, is there any other information you want to give us about this? And yeah, you go, it would just break down. It was me. You'd just be dying to tell somebody. Thank, it's, happened, it's happened before. Thank God you're here. It's happened before. It has happened before. It's psychology involved in this thing. Yeah. I'm not qualified in psychology. If only we had Julian Boone with us. If only. Back in Leicester, the profilers simply don't share Hampshire's enthusiasm for the suspect. I'm, I'm more impressed by the differences than the similarities. Right. Just between us, <laughs> it, it, it's not the same fellow. I mean, um, the idea of, oh, whoopsie daisy, I, yeah. look, I've got He's, all these cartridges. That's yeah. just not our man's no. style. He's got too high a self-respect for that. That's right. This guy lacks subtlety, mm. doesn't he? They, they, um, he's got features in common. Uh, and I can and see why that lady would have had her suspicions aroused. But yes. The so could I. But he. But actually, he, you know, he's um, he's a type, isn't he? You know, there the, the are sort of. He's not unique. No, <laughs> no, no, he's not. Well, I'm very happy with him. It all went very well. For him, if you like, um, um, I think we're quite happy to eliminate him entirely. Yeah. It was cooperative right from the start, uh, helpful, friendly. One particular thing about him, he's got a noticeable accent, and uh, that's never, that has never been brought up by any of the victims. Well, I really feel it's time to put it to bed for the time being at the moment. That was the last major avenue, major line of inquiry, to be honest, based, as you know, on the psychological profile. It's disappointing though, isn't it? Because you just, you know, you don't know it could happen again and... The worst we... thing is, this is the thing that's always in the back of my mind, because I've always been a bit reluctant to put it to bed undetected, is if it happens again, say in a year or two, and then they retrieve the file with the papers, and they go through it and they find someone who's a suspect, and they, find, they identify who's done it, and he's in the system all the time, and I haven't noticed it, or we haven't noticed it. But I think that's probably the case of all jobs like this. When you're involved in it, you're reluctant to let it go, you know? Three years since the last attack, ten years since the first. With every avenue exhausted, the police close the investigation down. Potentially it's very difficult. He's the kind of guy who might only be caught by coincidence. But maybe it's something quite unconnected with Farley Mount. I imagine he, he, he's sort of getting on with his, his ordinary life 
for a while, he will be happy to sort of coast with what he's got, but will come out of the woodwork enjoying it, laughing at it. Either when he gets bored. Or, no, bored, I think uh, so. Or when something happens to, to seriously upset him. This is almost like a game. It's, he enjoys what he's doing. Yeah. And uh, he'll give the dice another roll one day. We'll stay with Reality Night next tonight to follow the ups and downs of finding love in L.A. And it seems it's all about being seen at the right place with the right people. It's Hollywood love after the break.